Hi, I'm Avanti. I'm a PhD student in the Kandaji lab, and I'm going to talk to you about methods we have developed to use deep learning to learn transcription factor binding motifs. The goal of this work is to understand the DNA patterns, that is, the motifs that determine in vivo transcription factor binding, where a transcription factor is just a regulatory protein that binds to DNA. These proteins have affinities to certain patterns in the sequence that we refer to as motifs, and they also co-bind with other transcription factors that have their own sequence affinities. So our goal is to understand these combinations of sequence patterns or motifs that determine the binding of a particular transcription factor. The problem with classical motif discovery methods is that they tend to produce redundant and partially overlapping representations, as you can see on the left, where I gathered the motifs associated with ZNF143 across several databases. They are also often poor predictors of binding in vivo, even though in vitro you might be able to do experiments to get really good motifs, they don't always generalize in vivo. And they are also often poor at picking up important flanking nucleotides. They may get the core of the motifs, but the flanks are often missed. So the question is, can we learn consolidated sequence patterns that are also highly predictive of in vivo transcription factor binding? The way we're going to do this is we are going to train a deep learning model to predict transcription factor binding well, and then we're going to interpret the model to understand what it learned. To do this, we're going to set up a supervised task where our labels come from in vivo transcription factor binding profiles as measured by an experiment like ChIP-seq. Uh, the inputs to our model, which is going to be a binary classifier, are going to be DNA sequences, and the outputs will be a plus one if the region is bound by the target trans transcription factor, and minus one if the region is available to be bound, that is, it it's accessible in the particular cell type, but it's not bound by the transcription factor, which usually means that the region lacks the necessary sequence pattern or motif that the transcription factor has an affinity to. As a specific case study, my colleague Johnny trained a multitask TF binding uh, model to predict the binding of CTCF, ZNF143, and 65, which are all transcription factors. These were chosen because they have interesting co-binding patterns and they have important roles in regulating the 3D genome. So what is the current state of interpretability? If you have a DNA sequence and a prediction, plus one if the region is bound by the TF and zero if it's not, you can interpret the sequence to get important scores at individual bases, where a positive score means that that base contributes to the binding of the TF, and a negative score means that the base contributes to inhibiting the binding of the TF. And there are several methods to do this. DeepLift was developed by our lab, but there's also just taking the gradients at the sequences, using integrated gradients, and so forth. But the challenge is really, can we summarize all the motif patterns learned by the network across all the sequences? We may be able to look at individual sequences and see certain bases highlighted, but doing this across hundreds of thousands of sequences in our data set, and as a human trying to figure out what the recurring patterns are, is quite challenging. So what, is, uh, what are the existing approaches to try to extract patterns learned by the deep learning model? Well, a naive idea is to just look at individual pattern detectors, that's individual convolutional filters. And this was done in the DeepBind paper, which is a paper where they predicted transcription factor binding using sequence, just like the setup. Um, and here is a visualization of the convolutional filters learned for the model that predicted the binding of the GADA protein. And you can see, just by eye, there are very high levels of redundancy. This is actually very normal for deep learning because in practice, multiple neurons are going to cooperate with each other to predict the binding of a particular transcription factor. It's not as though these neurons act in a, independently, like in a vacuum. They all are present together. Deep learning models learn distributed representations. This is extremely characteristic. So the challenge is, how do we combine the contributions of multiple pattern detectors to find consolidated patterns? The insight that we had is that if you look at input level important scores, such as those produced by looking at the gradients or maybe deep lift or what, what have you, 
these scores represent the contributions of particular positions to the entire network when it works as a whole, because these scores are compu computed via backpropagation through all the neurons in the network. What that means is, if we find patterns in these important scores, we'll be kind of set because these patterns will represent uh, what the network responds to when it works as a whole. To do this, we developed TF Modisco, where Modisco stands for Motif Discovery from Important Scores. The first phase of TF Modisco involves computing important scores for every sequence for all the tasks. Going back to our case study, here is the sequence and here are its scores for CTCF, ZNF143, and 65. We start by segmenting into regions of high importance that we call secrets. And for each secret, and these are regions that are high in at least one task, and from the secrets, we extract vectors that represent the activity of the secret or the scores of the secret across all the tasks. We then cluster these per task vectors into meta clusters, uh, where all the secrets that fall into a particular meta cluster have a similar pattern of activity across the different tasks. So in the topmost meta cluster, these are secrets that positively contribute to CTCF and the ZNF143 binding and negatively contribute to 6.5 binding. The second phase of TF Modisco is to perform clustering within each meta cluster to get our motifs. To do this, the first step is to compute affinities between every pair of secrets using a cross-correlation like metric. It's like cross-correlation in that we slide the secrets across each other and look at all the possible alignments, and at every alignment, we compute the similarity and take the best similarity across all the alignments. But it's not a correlation that we're doing at every alignment, and I'll talk more about that in a bit. Once we have our affinity matrix showing the affinities between every pair of secrets, we can put that through our favorite clustering algorithm. In this work, we use Louvain community detection, like Phenograph. Um, and once we have our clusters, we can aggregate the secrets within a cluster to get our motifs. And note that the method that we use to do this aggregation is flexible. At the time of speaking, we're currently just doing a naive approach where we average the secrets, but you can imagine doing more sophisticated representations of the secrets, perhaps based on KMERS or whatever you think uh, will work best. Okay, so I mentioned that we don't use correlation. Why is that? Um, so to motivate why, consider the following example. Here's an input secret, and here are two patterns. So just by eye, which pattern do you think the input is a better match to? Let me give it a few seconds. Okay, cool. So if you use correlation, it will actually pick option two, even though there is a pretty major discrepancy at the position of the G. But if you use the metric that we developed, which we're calling the continuous Jacquard similarity, it picks option one, which I hope you'll agree is a better match. Uh, it agrees at more positions, and there's no major discrepancies. So what is the issue with correlation? Correlation involves taking element-wise products, if you just look at its formula. And what this means is that you have a polynomial of degree two, which inherently implies that agreement at larger magnitude positions get disproportionately more weight. As a motivating toy example, consider the input minus 1, minus 1, minus 2, 4, minus 1, minus 1, minus 1. Its correlation with a vector that's 0 at every position except for the 4 is 0.98. Uh, by correlation, like this is the formula for Pearson correlation. Whereas its correlation with a vector that's only 0 at the 4 and identical at all the other positions is 0.87. And the reason is simply that 4 has the largest magnitude. Okay. So the alternative metric that we developed, I think of it like a Jacquard distance for real numbers. And the way it works is the intersection of x and y is the min of the absolute values. And it gets a positive sign if the signs of x and y agree, and a negative sign if the signs disagree. The union of x and y is the max of the absolute values. Um, and the whole goal of doing this is really, at its core, to avoid squaring terms. You don't get disproportionate importance to larger magnitude terms. So the continuous Jacquard similarity when you have two vectors is you take the intersection of all the element-wise uh, elements. Uh, you, you, yeah, you take element-wise intersections, sum them up, and take element-wise unions, uh, sum that up, and divide the two. Analogous to uh, an actual Jacquard similarity. So going back to our toy example, 
when the input is, uh, you know, minus one, minus one, minus two, four, minus one, minus one, the continuous Jacquard similarity with this vector is four out of 11. And the similarity with the other, the second vector is seven out of 11. So it will pick out the second vector as the one that's more similar. Another interesting idea that we use is that we adapt our notion of density to the uh, a notion of distance to the local density of the data. Well, why do we do this? The issue is that the notion of what counts as far away varies depending on the cluster we're looking at. If we have a pretty weak motif where a lot of the matches to the motif have you know, several mismatches, there's, in general the TF may be binding with slightly lower affinity, the secrets on average may be further away from each other. So our notion of what counts as far away needs to take this into account. The solution, as I mentioned, is to adapt our notion of distance to the local density of the data. And we didn't come up with this idea. It's actually the very first step of TSNE. In the very first step of TSNE, you compute conditional probabilities, P of J condition on I, where the probability decays exponentially with the distance between I and J. And the rate of the decay is controlled by parameter beta. The cool thing is that this parameter beta is tuned to attain a desired perplexity. So that's what that perplexity parameter is all about. As a reminder, if you have a distribution where there's a probability of one over k on k items and a probability of zero on the rest, that distribution has a perplexity of exactly k. So you can think of k as roughly equal to the number of items that have a reasonably high but equivalent probability and the rest of the items have close to zero probability. Okay, um, so what this means is if you, if you always tune to attain a desired perplexity, a larger value of beta will be used in denser regions of the space, so you can be more strict over there about what you consider close to you, and uh, smaller values of beta will be used in sparser regions of the space. So we use this idea to adapt our notion of distance and we get probabilities that we pass into Louvain community detection. And I'm skipping several details, but these are two key ideas that I wanted to communicate because they, you might find that they're relevant in other projects that have nothing to do with this. Okay, so just going over the results, coming back to our case study, here are the meta clusters that we get for the model trained on CTCF ZNF 143 and 6.5. And I won't go over every single meta cluster, but I'll just take a tour of a few. In this meta cluster, which is high for CTCF and ZNF and low for 6.5, we get the CTCF motif consistent with known biology. In this meta cluster, which is high for ZNF and 6.5, we pick out the canonical 6.5 ZNF 143 motif. We pick out an ELF1 motif, and we pick out something that looks a lot like a CPG signature, which could be picking up the fact that ZNF 143 preferentially binds to promoters, which are rich in CPG. Uh, I want to mention that even when we find known motifs, they're often nicer to work with than the motifs that you come up you, that you come across in existing databases. For example, in this example where I gathered all the motifs relevant for 6.5 or ZNF143, uh, if you look at the single corresponding motif produced by TF Modisco, you find that it seems to recapitulate the patterns of all the, the, the motifs in, the, in these other databases. And you might be concerned of, about whether maybe when you collapse all these motifs together, maybe you're losing some, some information. Uh, and to check that, what we do is that we, we use the consolidated TF Modisco motif to predict TF binding. And we also, using a simple logistic regression model, so we use this single motif as a feature in logistic re regression, and compared to using all of the other fragmented motifs as features in logistic regression, we find that when you use the single consolidated feature, it's actually better for logistic regression at recapitulating the binding of the motif. So we don't seem to be losing information when this consolidation happens. Um, another interesting thing that sometimes happens is that the same motif can appear in different meta clusters. For example, in this meta cluster, which is high for CTCF ZNF 143 and 65, we found the CTCF motif popping up, which means that the CTCF motif can sometimes have a positive importance for 65 depending on the sequence that it occurs in. When we drilled into this, we found that these instances of the CTCF motif, where there's a positive contrib contribution to 65, they tend to co occur with the motifs from this other cluster, which was high for ZNF 143 and 65, which implies that when CTCF occurs in the presence of these other motifs, it tends to contribute positively to 65, uh, which conveniently enough is consistent with known biology showing that CTCF only co-binds with 65 in the presence of ZNF 143.
And uh, so we are going to be releasing this very, very, very soon. Uh, and thanks to my lab mate, Anna Sherbina, for preparing really nice user-friendly interactive web reports. So I'm very excited about this. Um, and just to summarize, uh, TF Modisco uses important scores to learn consolidated patterns across several tasks. If you study similar motifs that have different activity patterns depending on the sequence that they occur in, you can potentially find co-binding patterns. Um, it's not limited to deep learning. Any method that produces important scores could plug into this. So if you have a way to compute important scores for SVMs, you could plug it into this and see what you get. It's certainly not limited to sequence. You could apply it to different kinds of tasks, maybe finding footprints in accessibility profiles. Um, and in, instead of com comparing the important scores on the input level, um, you could compare the important scores on, say, some intermediate convolutional layer if you think that that will produce better clusters for you. So there's there's a lot of potential here to extrapolate to other domains. And uh, we I definitely plan to be releasing the code very soon. Just want to put some final touches on it. Um, but if you like really want early access to the code then and, and are willing to like deal with the fact that it may have bugs, uh, you can reach out to me or and my advisor and you know we can we can we can see what we can do. Um, but uh, yeah I'm very excited about this. Uh, and uh, thank you. Thank you. Looking forward to it.